Today we're looking at Genesis chapter 3. But before I start, I have a story to share from Bernard Brunsting. This comes from his book, The Lord's Laughter. So there was a woman that was married to a miserly man. She had to fight for everything he that she got. One day, she said she was going to go window shopping. He said, look, but don't buy. A few hours later, she came home with a new dress. What's this? Her husband fumed. I thought I told you to look, but not buy. Well, she explained, I saw this lovely dress and thought I'd try it on. And when I did, the devil said, it sure looks good on you. Right then, you should have told him, get thee behind me, Satan. Her husband explained, I did, she answered. But when he got behind me, he said, it sure looks good from the back, too. Satan is a trickster. This chapter is the first time we see Satan. Verse 1 says, And now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? At this point, we don't know how long Adam and Eve have been in the garden. We don't know if it's been days. We don't know if it's been years. Don't know if it's been decades. But sometime later. Notice the serpent isn't defined as Satan here. But in the rest of the Bible, Satan is described as a serpent. Before all this happened, at this point, the serpent had legs. He didn't start as a, a snake like we know it. He was a walking creature. Satan, information about Satan. In Ezekiel 28, it says Satan, before his fall, he was an angel of the highest rank. He is what was called a cherubim. That's the same kind of angel that Michael and Gabriel are. And he led the worship. And he was beautiful. Isaiah 14 says Satan's fall was because he wanted to be equal or greater than God. He set himself up against God's will. And of course we know there was no way he could be equal, anywhere equal to God. But he is crafty, and he is clever, and he is cunning. We can't outsmart Satan, but we can overcome him in the power of Jesus. So, demonic spirits, they can possess people or human, or sorry, or animals. In this case, Satan chose to possess the serpent. Satan himself is a spirit. He doesn't have a body, so he had to possess a body to interact with humans. So, imagine the serpent coming up and talking to, to Eve. What would you do if an animal came up and talked with you? It doesn't seem that Eve's surprised at this serpent speaking. Why is that? We, we really don't know. Um, did angelic beings and um, come to talk to Adam and Eve in, in animal form? Was it a normal thing for them? Or um, did the animals talk? Don't know. It doesn't say, and something you will hear me say is, if God needed us to, to know the details, he would have told us. How he spoke is more important than what he, he did said. Why did Satan choose Eve? Why not go to Adam? Remember, Adam got the order directly from God. Do not eat of this tree. Eve didn't get that. She wasn't even around when Adam got that command. She was more vulnerable to attack. Satan likes to attack our weakest link. He gets at Adam by tempting Eve. So the stronger links need to expect an attack from the weaker links. 
they need to help those who are young and new in the faith against attacks. All temptation starts by doubting God. So, is God's plan to allow Satan to tempt Eve? If Adam had sinned first and gave the fruit to Eve, Eve could have a partial excuse. I was simply obeying my Lord and Master. He gave me the fruit and I ate it because I'm a good wife. Well, that doesn't fly. That didn't happen that way. Um, so Satan starts us off with an attack against God's word. If he, if he could have Eve doubt what God said, his battle is partially won. If he can get us to doubt what God says, battle partially won. From the beginning, Satan is trying to undermine God's people by undermining God's word. One way is to get us to neglect God's word. We need to know God's word. Notice the name that the serpent used for God in this. It, it wasn't Lord. It was just God. Now, rabbis say that Satan couldn't use the name of God. He was just not allowed. Now, when God gave the command, if you look back, he said, you may eat of any tree, but. That was a positive statement. Look at all, everything you can eat. One thing you can't, but Satan turned it negative. He said, God won't let you. <laughs> that goes against our nature. We don't like to be told what we can and can't do. But God is God, and he has the authority and the power to tell us what we can and cannot do. But Satan knows human nature. Verse 2 and 3 say, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So Eve's first mistake, talking with Satan, the only thing we should ever say to Satan is, get out of here, the Lord rebuke you. And notice she starts with the positive. We can eat of any tree, but. Um, and Eve calls it a different tree. She just says it's the tree in the midst of the garden. She doesn't call it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, like God calls it. Now, was there anything magical about the fruit? No, doesn't seem like it. If you look at chapter 2, verse 17, what was God's command? And then you look at what Eve said in verse 3. It's close, but no Zakar. She put words in God's mouth. Revelation says, never add or take away from the word of God. She had a direct quote from God, and she added to it. Don't do that. Adam isn't innocent, even at this point. He heard God, and he must not have taught his wife right. We can almost picture Adam telling Eve, see that tree in the garden over there? Don't touch it, or God says we'll die. Well, it's better than nothing. What Adam didn't explain made her vulnerable to attack. Lest you die. That tree seems like such a small piece of obedience to hang the destiny of the entire human race on it and all creation. Did Eve even know what death was? Had had she seen death? Had any animal died? Had plants died? When he says, surely you shall die, does she have an inkling what that means? Possibly not. Um, what was important about that tree was it was 
an act of obedience. And here, Eve is having a problem with that. Verse 4 and 5 say, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat it, uh, that your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Um, some Jewish writers say that as soon as Eve had made her statement, the serpent pushed her against the tree and said, See, you touched it and you're still alive. So you can eat of the fruit. You won't die. Again, that's scriptural. But kind of a fun explanation. So Satan planted the seed of doubt. He exposed Eve's incomplete understanding of, the, of God's word. Now he moves in for the kill and with an outright contradiction of what God said. God wanted Eve to forget all about what God had said about the consequences of sin, of disobedience. Get Eve to doubt the goodness of God. If God lies to her, how can you, how can he be good? Satan wants us to see sin as something good that a bad God does want us to have. His main lie to us is sin is not bad and God is not good. Now, Satan's temptation is even more powerful because there's a little bit of truth in it. Their eyes would be opened, opened immediately to their own sin and rebellion. It's as if a deaf person was promised hearing and as soon as he can, all he can hear is screaming. The final enticement was, you can be like God. That's what Satan himself wanted, and that's why he fell. He wanted to be equal with God. There is no equality with God. The word for God here, Elohim, the creator God, the relational God. Eve tried to become a god, little g, by rebelling against God Elohim. The goal of trying to be God is at the center of so many non-Christian religions. In our desire to be gods, we become like Satan. It was Satan who said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above all the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. In contrast, we should be like Jesus, who came as a servant. There is only one God. There will only ever be one God, and we are not going to be him. Verse 4 says, So women, when the woman saw that the tree would that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Eve gave in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of her eyes, the pride of life. Satan is going to try to tempt Jesus in exactly the same way. Eve thought that the tree was good for food. Part right, part wrong. It tasted good. Um, but the fruit probably wasn't better than any other fruit that she could have. She was just deceived to think so. Just because fruit's pretty doesn't mean it's good. Can you think of a fruit that looks really nice that you just don't care for? She thought she was doing something good for herself. Even though Satan was tempting her, she didn't have to give in, but she did. Satan cannot force us to do anything. She can't say the devil made me do it. We can't say the devil made me do it. We give in to the temptation. And then Eve draws her husband into it. But Adam isn't deceived. He heard the command. 
he he knew God said, don't do this. His eyes were wide open and it was open rebellion against God. Could say Eve was naive, Adam was not. Adam carries the bigger responsibility for the fall. Eve was tricked. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. So why did he do it? Did he not want to disappoint his wife? Um, so there, here's some speculation. The rabbis say that's why, that Adam didn't want to be separated from Eve. If she was going to fall, he was too. Verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Apparently, the original garment was light. They had been clothed in God's glorious light. In their disobedience, they lost that covering of light. It felt, they felt exposed. They saw themselves changed, but now they looked at the world in a whole different way and it wasn't good. It's good to feel guilty when we've done something wrong. It would have been worse if they had felt no sense of shame. So they attempted to cover themselves. Lots of ingenuity, but it wasn't very wise. Um, they covered their private parts um, with fig leaves. Fig leaves are sticky. They got pointy things. They are not comfortable. They, they covered themselves with some of the worst stuff they could cover themselves with. Um, not comfortable at all. Um, and after making these coverings, they waited. God normally came and walked and talked with them um, in the evening. And they're waiting. What are they feeling? Is it dread? Is it fear? They're going to face the Almighty God. And they're going, they have shame. Verse 8 and 9 said, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Um, from the Hebrew structure of the sentence, this was a regular activity. So apparently it was something they did every day. So when God came and walked and talked with him, did he come in human form? Did, did he appear as Jesus Christ? Um... Did he come as Christ before his incarnation and birth at Bethlehem? Because God the Father has said no one has seen God at any time. John 1.18 says, And no one has ever seen God in the person of the Father. Um, so in what form did God appear? Again, another one of those things that God doesn't give the details. Um, or it could be what's called anthropomorph anthropomorphic, which means God doesn't walk and talk with them in the same way, you know, physically, but in spirit. Cool of the day literally means the breeze of the day. Um, with Geography and culture, we might, this is probably late afternoon, early evening. Um, so Adam and Eve hiding themselves means they knew that that fig leaf wasn't covering them enough. Um, they didn't do a, a fig leaf fashion show. They were embarrassed. So God comes and tries to find them. Now, does he know where they're at already? He wants to help the lost. 
and the hopeless in their sin. He wants to draw them to himself. And that's what he wants to do with Adam and Eve. He wants them to come to him. Um, so, again, why did he ask where they were? He obviously already knows everything. Why did he ask? This was a cry of an anguished father. He obviously knew where they were, but he knew, he knew, he felt that gulf between them. Now, did he have to wait till he came to earth for their walk to know? No, he, I'm sure he knew immediately. It's a gulf that only he himself would be able to bridge through Jesus Christ. This was more of a question to Adam, for Adam. It would kind of arouse him into the idea that he was lost and that he needed to confess his sin and, and be sorrowful over it. This shows that God is seeking the lost man he always has and that we are accountable for what we do. Now God demanded an answer. You got no Miranda rights with God. He asked a question, he expected an answer. Verse 10 through 12 say, and he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to me with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. Saddest response to questions ever. Sin brought fear of God. Adam was afraid of God's voice. Ever since Adam, men have been running from God's presence. They don't want to listen to his word because it exposes our sin. God asks more questions that he knows the answer to. He's hoping that Adam will take, make the best of a bad situation by confessing right then and there. But nope. What does God want us to do when we sin? We, can, we rarely can do something about yesterday's sin. So, the, although sometimes we can give restitution, but we can confess and repent of that sin. So God confronted Adam's problem straight on. Um, it wasn't a wardrobe problem, like those fig leaves don't look good on you. It wasn't a fear problem. It wasn't a self-esteem problem. It was a sin problem. And Adam's wardrobe, his fear, his self-understanding couldn't be addressed until the sin problem was addressed. So often we address all the problems around sin and forget about addressing the sin itself. And it's not taken care of until we address the sin. So where is Eve? God hasn't addressed Eve at all. That's because Adam is the head. Now the problem is... Adam blames Eve. That's, that's human nature. So few of us are willing to say, as David said, I have sinned against the Lord. He also refused responsibility for his part in her sin. Then he blames God by saying, she's a woman you gave to me. If you hadn't given her to me, there we wouldn't have any problem at all. He added to his guilt by being unkind to Eve, placing all the blame on her, and then blaspheming against God, his maker, all in trying to escape from confessing his sin. Verse 13 says, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So it seems like the same thing just passing it on. But think about it. Did the serpent deceive her and did she eat? 
Yes, she is telling the truth. The problem is when we fail to see that being deceived, giving into that deception is sin too. That's the part she doesn't do. Now to the serpent. Verse 14 through 15 say, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and become, sorry, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God questioned Adam, then Eve. What questions are there to Satan, to the serpent? Nothing. There was nothing to teach him. He knew he was a liar. He gets a curse. The first part of the curse is against the snake. He's cursed above more than all livestock and cattle. Are cattle cursed? Um, I guess being cattle, I don't know. So God commands the serpent to slither on the ground. He takes the legs away. Um, anything that crawled on the ground was considered unclean by the Hebrews. So the serpent becomes an unclean animal. So, whew, if Satan got that, Adam and Eve are probably super nervous now. Um, so to eat dust indicates total defeat. God's judgment on Satan is for him to always know total defeat. The serpent eat friendship, over. God placed a natural fear of serpents in humans. Um, Satan's hatred of Eve was nothing new. It was always present. But now man is going to generally be an enemy of Satan. There's now a na natural fear of Satan in the, in the heart of man. If we are born naturally rebellious to God, and we are, we are also born cautious and afraid of Satan. We have to be hardened to willingly and knowingly serve Satan. And there are a lot of people who do that. Instinctively, we don't serve God or, or Satan. We serve ourselves, and that's just fine with Satan. We learn to serve God. This is the first, also in verse um, 15, this is the first prophecy of the Messiah to come and the doom of, of Satan. The real battle between Satan and the seed of woman. Jesus is coming. Satan would warn the Messiah when he says he shall bruise his heel, but the Messiah is going to crush Satan with a mortal wound. He shall bruise your head. The plan of salvation is already being talked about at this point. To bring deliverance through the one known as the seed of the woman. This is called the scarlet thread. We're going to see throughout the Old Testament that God is telling the same story of redemption. So the heel, it says... Um, the serpent will strike at the heel. That's a part of, of a person that a, a serpent can easily reach. Um, the prophecy also gives a hint of the virgin birth, declaring that the Messiah, the deliverer, would be the seed of woman, not the seed of man. Normally, when you talked about a child, they were the child of the father. This time is talking about the child of the mother. So Satan knows if he gets rid of these people, he can win. So he has throughout history um, driven people to attempt to kill all the Jews. Genocide. 
trying to wipe them all out. It's never been successful. It will not ever be successful. There, be, there will always be at least a remnant. So Adam and Eve probably don't understand any of this. She probably thought when Cain was born that that fulfilled this. She doesn't know what's to come in the future. Verse 16 says, To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So now the curses for Adam and Eve, starting with Eve. This is a starts a pretty broad curse. There's four major elements. Pain in childbirth. Now no creature seems to go through the same pain as women in childbirth. I mean, you you can have the occasional cow that has a breech birth, but you know, the, all the contractions and things we go through, that seems to be oh, uniquely human. Too many children to raise. Um, we have problems associated with raising children and the dominance of the husband. Both men and women have known sorrow throughout history. Yet the unique sorrow of the woman is, is well known. Under Jesus, some of the effects of this curse are relieved. It's, it's been the Christianizing of society that brought rights and dignity to women. It's, it's hard for us to realize what women are going through in, in non-Christian lands, the, the suffering, um, where in many countries, a woman is just barely above a cow. But we have a God who respects us all, and he always has. So the last part of this verse contrasts the woman's desire and her husband's rule over her. It's a, a, a challenge to embrace the husband as the leader in his role. But because of the curse, women will fight against that, against their husband's desire for leadership. And it works against God's ordained order for the home. Now to Adam, verses 17 through 19 say, And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return." Again, it wasn't just as if Adam took Eve's advice. He chose to disobey. Um, he chose to pay attention to Eve rather than God. It was almost like idolizing Eve in his disobedience. Because of Adam, there's a curse upon all creation. Because of Adam, there's a curse on the ground. Up till then, the ground only produced good. After that, it's still going to produce good, but there's going to be thorns and thistles and, and weeds and things that just are not helpful. Um, this curse promises thorns and thistles. So think about it. Jesus was crowned with thorns when they put that crown of thorns on him, the curse of the earth was on his head. Verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Up till now, we haven't had a name. Now again, you probably, this may be a verse that was not necessarily in, this, in the same order as 
we typically write again Hebrew writing. Sometimes, um, sometimes it goes back and then comes forward. They write more topical at times. So um, up till now, we've seen her called a helper, a female, a woman, a wife. She was called the mother of all living, even before she, any, she was a mother of anyone. She was named in faith. God said a deliverer would come from her. So her name reflects that promise. Verse 21 says, and this is kind of cool, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. They tried to clothe themselves and it was a disaster. Um, just like when we try to clothe ourselves with good works, it's a disaster. It's like Adam and Eve trying to clothe themselves with fig leaves. Now, if God was only interested in clothing, he could have taken sheep and taken the wool off and covered them and the sheep would have been fine, but he had a bigger plan. In order to cover them, a sacrifice was needed. An animal had to die. God was the first to kill anything. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Again, scarlet thread. Centuries later, there'll be another sacrifice to cover our naked sin. Adam naming, naming Eve in faith and God's provision show that they had faith in God's promise, in his promise of a savior and, his, and in receiving his sacrifice. If you wonder if they're in heaven, they are. They had faith. Verses 22 through 24 say, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So verse 22 is kind of hard to, hard to understand. Maybe it's sarcastic. Since they kind of, since they know everything type of thing. Or maybe it focuses on man's growth and knowledge in the bad things. Now he knows all, knows about evil. Don't know. Did Adam and Eve want to stay in the garden? Hard to imagine they wouldn't. But God said, no. So God kicked him out of the garden and he placed cherubim there. Again, when sometimes we think of cherubim as these little cute baby angels. No, they were mighty warrior angels. Again, Lucifer, Satan when he was in heaven, Michael and Gabriel are all from the cherubim. Warrior angels. They're always associated with the presence and glory of God. Every time we see them, it marks a meeting place with God. So, when it says cherubim, it's plural. So why, why send the mightiest of all angels to do this? Couldn't could it be to keep out the fallen angels? It guarded the way to the tree of life. And remember, God never told them they couldn't eat of the tree of life. They didn't seem to be tempted by that one. They were tempted by the one that God said, don't eat. This is the last mention of Eden in the Bible. What happened to it? Did it, did it just kind of go to bad seed? Did it start blending in with the 
geography. Now those trees, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. We're going to see them in Revelation. But Eden, don't know. Don't know if it's just a hidden thing or if it just blended in with the landscape. Again, if that was important for us to know, God would have told us. So that is chapter 3. We'll see you later with chapter 4.